I'll switch to English now to introduce Mirjana Stoilovic, our last uh, guest of the day. Uh, Mirjana is a scientist at the Parallel Systems Architecture Lab in the School of Computer and Communication Sciences at EPFL. Her research expertise includes hardware security, design automation, machine learning, side channel attacks, cloud computing, as well as embedded system design. And some of her projects include a video game component um, that she will uh, discuss today. So thank you for joining us, Mirjana, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. Let me share my screen. So you should all be able now to see my screen, I hope. I will uh, talk about the use of games in the course that I give, computer architecture. So before that, I just wanted to introduce uh, briefly the, uh, the lab, the group where I am. I'm in Parallel Systems Architecture Lab, held, um, led by Professor Baba Kalsafi at uh, EPFL at the School of Computer and Communication Sciences. Uh, Parsa and myself, we engage in research and educational activities to pioneer future server design. But as, uh, as you said, my research also goes in other directions, uh, electronic design automation, reconfigurable architectures, and hardware security in recent times. In Parsa, we give um, several courses. Uh, they are all listed in this link that I share, but I wanted to highlight uh, some bachelor and master courses, in particular the first one, which is uh, computer architecture, the topic of uh, my presentation today, that is given to students of computer science and communication systems in the third semester. Then there is introduction to multiprocessor architecture, as well as advanced multiprocessor architecture given by Professor Baba Kalsafi later in the fifth semester of bachelor, as well as first semester of master. Computer architecture is a, a course given in the fall, four credit course to the third semester students. It is uh, organized in uh, two hours per week lectures, ex cathedra or Zoom, depending on the circumstances, and two hours per week practical work, lab work. It is offered in programs of computer science and communication systems, as well as Passarelle from HOS to computer science, and computer science minor in the master studies. For Computer Architecture 1, there is one required course, it's Digital System Design, given in the second semester of uh, Computer Science and Communication System program. I'm showing here some data uh, about the number of students that I have in the class. I started teaching it in 2016. Initially, there were about uh, 200, 210 people with a little drop in 2018, but since then, I'm seeing a larger number of students and I can predict even uh, the, the highest number uh, expecting next semester around 270 students in the class. Uh, the curriculum itself is uh, based on uh, some chapters from a famous computer organization and design book by David Patterson and John Hennessy. The course is organized essentially in three main parts. In the first part, we have students discover what is the heart of a computer. What is a processor? What is its basic structure? How does it work? And how it is really programmed. And the goals of this first part are to create, uh, students have them create elementary, but uh, fully functional processor using some uh, hardware design language. And another goal is to have them learn programming in assets. In the second part of the course, we focus on computer arithmetic, how computers manipulate numbers, what are the basic and maybe less frequently seen representation for numbers, how are arithmetic components built and designed, what are overflows and how are we to properly handle them. And the goal is to understand computer arithmetic. And the third and the last part is about memory hierarchy in a computing system. Students discover how to build a memory system. We cover memory technologies. We see that memory is slow, well, slower than the processor. So we learn how to avoid slowing down the entire system. We see that memory is expensive and it is limited, but it's of course crucial for a good functioning. So we learn about virtual memory, how to cheat the programmer into believing that memory is almost infinite. So the goal is to understand typical memory hierarchy. 
In the course, we have graded hands-on projects that are done in teams of two students and that both require using this board that I'm showing here. We call it Gecko for Education Board. The board main component is a field programmable gate array, a circuit that allows students to design a piece of hardware that they want and implement it on it. There are two projects, uh, hands-on projects always. The first one is essentially to have them design a multi-cycle processor by themselves. And the second project is to code a game, one a retro game, obviously, in assembly and run it on that multi-cycle processor that they have implemented uh, previously. On top of it, we ask them also to do a live demonstration of uh, their game. These two projects are graded in a fully automated uh, fashion. The board itself was designed by Theo Clutter, who teaches the prerequisite course, Digital System Design. And as you can already see, the board is designed with the games in mind. We have an LED array that we use as screen. There are, of course, buttons to control the evolution of the game. And there is a display for the score. Now, Thinking about why games in computer architecture, one, there are many reasons. I'm here uh, just selecting a few. Uh, first, students are obviously already familiar with the retro game rules. Uh, it's uh, highly likely that they had played those games when they were younger. Having a game is, uh, I find, highly motivating because students care to complete the project, get to the end, they want to play the game, and with the a game, it's easier to spot bugs because one knows what to expect, how the game should play. But it's also, and this is very important, more rewarding to spend time to try to find the bugs and remove them. Games also favor using a real hardware over simulation because playing a game that one has played on a real hardware is unnatural suddenly to play in simulation. But also on my side as a teacher, it's, uh, it gives me an occasion to, to have students get familiar in programming this particular circuit, an FPGA. Making a game work requires problem solving skills. For these projects, students develop skills that from low level device firmware development, such as switching on an LED, clearing an LED, creating timers, updating memory contents and so on but all the way up to some relatively complex algorithms because they need to put everything together to have the game works. Finally, as always, working in teams means uh, fostering interaction and collaboration with peers. So for me, having games in this course, especially when they need to code in assembly, which is very low level programming language, um, the, the goal is to have this learning part somehow happen with fun. Now coming to the actual games that we had in the course. Uh, uh, so I started teaching in 2016. In 16 and 17, there was a game, uh, it was Pong essentially that we asked students to implement. So two players, a table, two paddles and a ball. Using a paddle, a player hits the ball back to the opponent, but if it misses the ball, then the opponent wins the point and the game reinitializes. In terms of implementation, the students had to describe the ball by its uh, location, by its velocity vector. They had to periodically update the ball's position to control its movement using the, the buttons, control the pedal movement, sorry, and uh, display a score. At the time, we were using LEDs to display the score. Then in 2018, we went for snake game, a single player game with the well, snake, walls, and food. Snake would grow as it reaches, finds food, and it would die if uh, hits a wall, edge, or itself. As far as implementation goes, students had to represent the snake, walls, and food as LED pixels that are lit. They needed to generate food at randomly selected locations, use buttons to control the snake's head movement or game restart and this time to show the score on a seven segment display. In 2019, we went for Tetris, single player game. These five tetraminos that I'm showing here are those that we had asked students to initially implement. Students, of course, needed to 
periodically move the tentraminos, have them drop down from the top, try to arrange them in the continuous line to gain points and have the line disappear. As far as implementation goes, there were four pixel tetraminos, and they had to describe them using the orientation and the location of what we define to be an anchor point of each tetramino. They had to randomly generate selection, randomly select the shape of the tetramino and the orientation, as well as the starting location, which would be somewhere on top. You see on the right, they would use the buttons to move the tetraminos or to rotate them or to clear preset the game and the score would be shown on the uh, this seven segment display. And last year we had Conway's game of life, no players. <laughs> uh, in this game, the students used the LEDs to represent to light them to represent cells that could be alive if lit or uh, dead if not lit. And periodically update the state of the game. So have the game evolve. Uh, they needed to cover four, four states, underpopulation, overpopulation, reproduction, stasis. And essentially for every cell, whether it's alive or dead, they had to either keep its status or to change it into a different status depending on the state of its neighbors. So they use the LED screen as the playing field they were asked to define some, gen some seeds and to also be able to randomly generate seeds and to use the buttons to start, pause, control the speed of the game, reset the game or generate another seed. Besides all these games, we also had introduced a game challenge award in recognition for the most creative game implementation. Here, students would self-nominate themselves and we would give them full freedom to modify, improve the game specification, to introduce new features, to render the game more interesting. And then in the end, we would choose a winner. It would be the te whole teaching team that would choose the winner by voting between the candidates. Here I'm showing the, the certificate that we gave to students in 18 and 19, but this was also accompanied by some gifts, for instance, a small embedded system that we could play with or uh, some delicacy, some dessert. Unfortunately, we didn't ha have it last year for obvious reasons. And I'm arriving to the fun of my presentation. I would like to show you a video of the winning game in 2019. These are Ahmed Etz and Arnold Poletta who kindly agreed that I share this video today. Uh, they will show their game and uh, I, uh, I'm happy to, to play it. Arnaud Poletto. Yeah, Arnaud we are uh, Team 19. So when you start, you have a main menu that says play and it starts when you press any button. You can also pause the game if you press in the middle instead of reset and when you press again it resumes. Um, when you press the two outer buttons it folds uh, rapidly, like that. And we also added two new pieces, the L and S, uh, but reversed or flipped. We also added a debouncer in the processor, so before when you press the button it might have played twice, now when you press it, uh, it's smooth and only occurs once. We uh, Also the game gets faster as you play, uh, you have to play a lot, a lot to see it, but uh, yeah. Also when you get a full line the score increments by 200 instead of uh, 1 because it's more rewarding, and when you get a high score, um, you get a smiley face in the end. Um, but yeah, you need to get more than one mm -hmm. uh, zero to, to get a high score. There was the winning game. With this, I'm finishing the presentation and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mariana. It's a, it's a fascinating course. Uh, it's really interesting the way you, you use video games to, to, to teach uh, uh, computer architecture and, and, and coding. 
it's so it also makes sense because you know in the history of computing video games as a field of experimentation have have played a, an important role i was wondering do, do you address these questions of history sort of historical questions around the use in vid of video games within the history of computing or questions relating to i know this is far from the what, what you're actually teaching but maybe um, you know concepts around game design because your students are basically uh, designing games is is this something that would be useful to some extent i you're giving me good ideas now i haven't been doing it so far but uh, why not it's actually uh, quite quite a good idea to to add it to, to make it to make it more interesting and to give it a, a bit more background and motivation to to using it motivation to me is very clear but uh, doing that will also help uh, clarify the motivation also to 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 the students thank you are there other questions in the chat, my colleagues? Uh, maybe a small remark. I had um, the same question as, uh, as Selim uh, <laughs> about the history of computing. And um, right now we are trying, when we study video games and history, we are trying to make sense of assembly because we, we have not learned that in uh, in our studies so yeah just a small remark if you were uh, interested in collaborating with us on the history of video games and um, uh, everything which makes assembly still relevant uh, today but also in the study of uh, the history of video games uh, i would be very happy to get in touch with you thanks Amy. thank you very much for your presentation You're welcome thank you for inviting it's really a great event Thank you, Mariana. It's it's 2 p.m. sharp. I'll switch back to French. <laughs>